Well, we all live in these three dimensions of time. The past, which you would mostly like to forget. Uh, the present, which is most uncomfortable. And the future, which is rather abstract and dim. So in these three di dimensions of existence, we try to find a philosophy of life that will help us to capitalize on the various liabilities that are accumulated along the way of life. One of the problems that many older people suffer from is too good a memory of the past. As they grow older, the intervals between youth and age gradually fade away. But many of the episodes of early life become increasingly unpleasant or tension-ridden uh, as we try to not remember but cannot actually forget our own past. I think we should all begin to understand the past as a kind of laboratory in which a great many experiments were made. Some were useful, some were useless. Some have advanced our destinies and others have definitely damaged us. But the past is a long way off, and actually there is nothing the human being can do about it in most cases. He would like to forget, but he cannot. But instead of forgetting, he should begin to remember in terms of lessons in terms of experiences and adventures that have contributed to the major episodes of his career. If we will take each disappointment and try to understand what it finally did for us, we will not be so unhappy because of what it did to us. In the problem of the past, we realize one thing in particular. The individual who looks back on his own past is not the same person who had the experiences of the past. Practically every part of his nature, physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual, are different from the days of his extreme youth. He is no longer the person he was. He is now struggling as hard as he can to become the person he wants to be. But in the interval, he may blame himself and go through a series of traumatic circumstances because of the mistakes he made while he was young. As he is not the same person, it is difficult for him to judge his own past. It is almost as difficult as it would be for him to judge someone else's past. According to our natures and temperaments, we use the past in various ways. One of the usages is to excuse our present weaknesses or to explain why we are not doing better now. This part of the excuse mechanism is not relevant. The individual who has gone through an, an important conglomerate of experiences has had very valuable opportunities to learn. At the time, he could not use these opportunities. He was too much involved in them. But now, looking back over a period of years, he can gradually put his own life in order. And nearly everyone past middle age has some part of this problem to face. He must gradually transform the years that have passed into lessons, opportunities, realizations, and discoveries. He should, should not go on blaming himself forever for his mistakes, nor should he try to excuse the condition of the present time on the ground of an unfortunate or distressful childhood. There is never any excuse for the individual to be what he was yesterday or be what he was many years ago except to learn. 
and to try to use these experiences as excuses for present peculiarities is a waste of time. It is very good to remember the past for what it has done to help us to grow. And the things that have helped us the most are the things, probably, that we most resent. We have to recognize the importance of environment upon our personal characteristics. Also, as we go back over past within ourselves, we have become involved in the past of the collective to which we belong. Those who can remember back 40 or 50 years remember back to a way of life that is practically extinct. They remember conditions and circumstances which just no longer exist. And in many instances they continue to bring forward into present conditions old policies that are no longer workable. Thus we have the very conservative person who is constantly regretting that the past no longer dominates his personal life. He wishes he could be back in an environment of 50 years ago, when things seemed more honest, where the world seemed to be more reasonable, uh, where opportunities to live were more simple. All these are nostalgic remembrances of past times. Yet if this same person today was actually transported back to that time that he is thinking about, it would no longer seem attractive to him. It is because in the course of remembering, emotion steps in and dramatizes and glorifies things that are no longer possible. Actually, we have to face the simple fact that as times change, our own patterns of conviction must also be gradually modified. We had certain beliefs that were sufficient to the 20s and 30s of the present century, but these beliefs do not do much for us today. They are no longer capable of carrying us constructively over the patterns of problem which we now face. Therefore, it is a mistake to try to force the past upon us or to try to live in a generation that no longer exists. Many people try to do this, and in some instances they seem to have a certain measure of success, but they have it at the expense of new growth. They are not able to handle the, the opportunity of the moment. They are not able to make the decisions that are necessary now because their decision mechanism is centered 30 or 40 years ago. So the past becomes quite a problem. The past becomes the source of a great evasion mechanism that is more or less substantiated by modern psychoanalysis. Psychology, as it is practiced today, depends very heavily upon the past life of the person to explain his present condition. While there is some validity in this, the continual emphasis upon the past merely indicates to the professional that the person has not outgrown his own earlier life. He is still focused in it, even though years have passed. He is still trying to dramatize events and practices and policies which he can no longer follow or apply to his present condition. Now I know in working with people myself that nearly everyone who is in trouble in some way blames the past for it. He blames the fact that his parents did not understand him. That was 25, 30 years ago. He also blames the circumstance that, that he came from a broken home. This also was long ago. He finds out also that various experiences of early life, association with other people, damaged him to some degree. He may have decided to make changes in his life without due thoughtfulness. Health problems may have burdened him early relationships, romantic situations, 
may have proven to be unfortunate. And gradually the person has come to consider himself, as he is now, as a victim of his own earlier living. And he is able very clearly to his own satisfaction to prove that he was not responsible for the misfortunes that occurred to him. Now, nature has given us a series of faculties and powers with which to cope with events. The human mind and the emotional nature, if properly and normally educated, both of these can help us to solve any problem or dilemma that arises within ourselves. But very often we do not use these faculties to solve. We use them to justify a condition that exists today. We blame the past, therefore, for the problems and unhappiness that we have now. We believe firmly that if we had married a different person, it would all be different. If our parents had taken different attitudes, we would be happier. If we had not been subject to too much criticism, if there was not too much favoritism in the family, we would be much happier today. All of these points can be rationalized and can be justified in a certain way. They can be justified because they did happen. They can be justified because they hurt us when they happened. But that they should continue to hurt us 30 or 40 years later is simply not justified. We find that we have not outgrown our own past. And this is something that every individual has to learn to do. One of the ways of outgrowing your past is to approach it in an entirely different manner. And that is to approach it in terms of education. What did we learn? Where did we miss the message? What happened that should have been more important to us and we paid no attention to it? What have we done with a life in later years to clear up the difficulties of the past. It may well be that 15, 20 years ago we began to study a little philosophy, perhaps became more idealistic, had better religious associations, and tried to understand the laws of the universe in which we live. For 12 or 15 years we have been continuing this research. But for one reason or another, it has not affected this load of the past in us. We have had a new philosophy. We claim new beliefs. We believe in universal justice and integrity. We believe in reincarnation and karma. And yet those old grievances sit just as firmly as they were before. We do not apply what we are believing now uh, to our estimation of our own past. We continue to be irritable in spite of the fact that we are studying a philosophy that tells us not to be irritable. We continue to hate people when the text we are reading tells us to learn to love them. We continue to blame others, but the philosophy tells us that we are to blame for our own troubles. But all of these teachings which put the blame back upon us are quietly ignored. We still take the teaching, but we do not apply it to the memory sequences of our own living. We do not try to make these adjustments, which we know should be part of growth. We want to become better people. We want to be greater in our idealism and devotion and more sincere in our religious conviction. And yet there is this load of undigested incidents in our background which we simply cannot let go of. I know a person who was very deeply involved in the idea of universal brotherhood and believed firmly that uh, we should all get along together. They had a very nice philosophy of life and they were trying their best to live it. But one day they heard of a relative who was coming from back east to visit them. Instantly, all the mood changed. Bitterness was all over the place. And this person frankly said, 
if this person comes to my house, I will throw them out. In the fact, all around were little pictures of Jesus. There were good greetings. There were good friendships. But the personal grievance was bigger than anything else. Now, it may not be that the average person has such a strong grievance. But there are some mostly, in most lives, there are persons we're not very anxious to meet again. We cannot forgive them what they did to us. And by having this lack of forgiveness, we also, in many cases, have failed to estimate the facts themselves very carefully. It is very difficult to be imposed upon by another unless we have some ulterior motives in ourselves. If what we are trying to do is to promote our own interests at the expense of other people, it is very likely that we try to do this and injure them. Then when they react, we are miserable, but we forget entirely what our own motive was. So to go back and study these things, it is necessary to get a good separate look and be able to really try to clear this memory stable of all the evil and negative thoughts that are there. It's a real project. And the more we are overburdened by the past in our daily living and realize this, the more important it becomes to clear the situation as quickly as possible. So the past should be gradually reduced to a textbook in which we can discover ourselves, our mistakes, the miscalculations that we made, the failure to meet things honestly and fairly, procrastination and personal emotion and jealousies and things of this nature which made the whole pattern unpleasant over a period of years. After a little while, we can, with a little thought, get a more impersonal attitude towards our own past. After all, it's gone. We are not going to gain anything by holding on to it dramatically. Whatever happened then happened is not going to be changed. For the most part, the only part of the picture that can be changed is our relationship to it. We can change our point of view on any problem, but this is the only way we can alter it in any appreciable degree. So out of the past comes a vast body of information. It is almost like a study of the world's memory. We remember history, we remember religion, art, music, literature, philosophy, science. All of these great streams of tradition have descended to us from the past, and they have become to a large measure the dominant forces of the present day. And many of these things that have descended to us, in the hope that we will use them wisely, have become the basis of further misfortunes, misunderstandings, crime, war, and bloodshed. Actually, this past has to be handled very intelligently. And uh, for most persons, the only past that they really can work with is themselves, because they are the only person who actually knows what they thought and how they felt when various circumstances arose. So it would be very nice, especially with older people who become more or less uh, alone in life or do not have the activities of earlier days, to be able to live very quietly and constructively and happily with themselves. And if they can get rid of memories that are unfortunate, this is one of the major ways of li living more comfortably with your own mental and emotional life. And the only way we can possibly get rid of these memories constructively is not to try to forget them, but to remember them very clearly and remember how we could have prevented them or have solved them, and even at a late time, honestly estimate the factors involved. And if we were guilty of a mistake, remember that it was years ago, it may have been the best thing we knew at the moment. It was all we had to work with at the moment. We had no discipline over the various attitudes of our minds and hearts, so we reacted perhaps unfortunately. 
So we are in the presence of an unfortunate situation due to lack of maturity. We are the victims of our own ignorance at the moment. This ignorance may be painful at the time and may continue to be a little regretted, but it can take the edge off of practically every destructive memory and assure us that we were doing the best we knew at the time. But now, from a longer perspective, the great, the great lesson, the real meaning of the incident, can be estimated and become part of soul growth and soul power within our own natures. There is no reason why we cannot make the experiences that have troubled us the foundation of a new enlightenment, a richer relationship with conditions as they really are. So out of the past, we come and move into the present. Now, the present at this time is a unique immediacy. It is probably something that we have never quite experienced before and may never experience again in the long cycles of living. This tremendous emergency in which we are now functioning. We are living in a time in which a lot of old blackbirds are coming back to roost under our eaves. Mistakes that we made in the past collectively are beginning to move in on us. Habits that were wrong are affecting nations and races and, and societies. And nearly every negative emotion or attitude that has troubled us in the past is being thrown into our faces again. This is because we didn't solve it in the first place, and this is the second place, and the second place is now. So the immediacy is a time of tremendous value to us. It is a time in which we should do everything possible to become correctly informed about the conditions under which we live. It is not any longer reasonable or proper to simply throw blame around. It is easy enough to accuse everybody of everything just as we in the past personally may have accused people of wrongdoing, which was really our own fault. But this problem of throwing brain blame around is of no value to us. The average citizen must face the simple fact that he is not going to be able to control the fate and destiny of the world in which he lives. The only way in which he can try something is usually violence, which only complicates and dramatizes and injures the values involved. But we are here as private citizens. We are not going to be here for the whole of the pattern for, in most probabilities, unless we are quite young. We are here and we are learning something and then we are going to retire before the final decisions are given. These decisions we will catch up with at a later time. But at the moment, we are working to try to prevent the world as it is from damaging the inner life of the individual. He may face the physical circumstances, but he cannot afford to allow the problems that are occurring uh, to acidify his inner life. He cannot become a hater or a doubter or a cynic or a skeptic or an activist simply because the world is in trouble. Here again we have a great problem to face, the problem of learning to live according to the inner part of our natures. Gradually in the last 25 years especially, we have given every emphasis to material things. We have made the comfort of the body the most important of all considerations. We have also developed the idea that minds are not made to think with, their minds are made to be entertained by. Also, the emotions are not something to stir up some really constructive values in our lives. Our emotions are simply gratifications of various tensions, pressures, and stresses within our own psychic constitution. Therefore, today, we are living on the outside of ourselves. We are living on the outside of human society. We are living on the outside of a small planet on a very small solar system. 
and that with all this limitation upon ourselves, it should become more or less obvious that we are not here as individuals to make the tremendous stressful efforts to change the world. What we have to do is to learn for ourselves why things are as they are, what is wrong with them, and how they can be cured or helped, and then take these decisions and apply them directly to ourselves. In other words, we have to adjust to an environment which can be traumatic. It can be no longer a lesson. It can be just pain. It can no longer be accepted as a step forward in personal growth. It is simply bewilderment. Little by little, the individual is allowing the virtues which he was born with to fade away within himself. His, li his life is one of compromises. His life is devoted very largely to gratification of whatever pleasures or enjoyments he can find. And, of course, one of the main things is to keep his mind off of the realities of the circumstances with which he is surrounded. He does not want to partake of anything. He wants to laugh and play his way through his years and look forward almost hopefully to the possibility of ultimate extinction. This is the way the average person today is thinking. Wonderful things are happening from which he can learn something. But he is too busy trying to uh, escape any form of mental or emotional discomfort or anything that involves too much physical labor. He simply wants to live as a perpetual adolescent, gratifying his feelings continuously and gaining nothing from his embodiment in this troubled sphere. Never before, probably, has the world as we know it been a better textbook than it is now. Nearly everything we need to know is right here. What we should do about it is more or less right here. What we can do about it may be less obvious, but it is still somewhere lurking in the patterns. We can and must recognize that this is no time to devote the rest of our lives uh, to various electronic games or something of that nature. This is not the time to relax on recreational drugs. This is not the time for the individual to lose all track of his integrities. This is a time in which the individual must either gain a new insight into values or he will not only have a wasted life, but he will have a life that has a very hard and tragic termination. He has to begin to make use of the present as a means of gaining insights. The world today should tell him a great many things about his own selfishness, his own cupidities, his own arrogance and most of all of his eternal and continuing self-centeredness. He should learn, maybe as the Buddhist knew years ago, uh, that we are not here merely to compete with each other. We are not here to try to outdo the achievements of another and rise to success over the bodies of those whom we have sacrificed to our ambitions. We are here to develop a commune of cooperative realizations. We are here to gr learn to live together as friends, as neighbors, and as workers toward a common goal, the improvement of society. If we continue as we are, with no one really caring about trying to do anything about anything except to be as comfortable as possible, the situation will go worse and worse, and little by little, the karma of negligence will descend upon all of us. Then the interesting fact of the problem comes into focus. Even though a major disaster should occur, and we hope it won't, the individual who is right inside will not only survive, but will find that he can handle the problem to his own need without great tragedy or trauma. 
if the person is right, if the person is sound in his own convictions, the circumstances around him cannot shake him from his foundation. If, however, he has no foundation and is just living from day to day, hopefully or regretfully, he will find in an emergency he has nothing to depend on. He will simply be a shipwrecked character in a sea of trouble. So it is very necessary for the individual to begin to use constructively and with dedication the faculties with which he has been endowed. Each person should be a little uh, island of honesty in this sea of competition. Each individual should do what he knows inside himself to be right. And he should also realize that he was not put here to waste time. He was put here to learn something. And if he learns it, he will live. If he doesn't learn it, his troubles will be multiplied. We are here in a world that is full of opportunities for magnificent progress. We are living on the verge of an age in which things could be more remarkable and useful than ever before. But our only reaction seems to be to abuse and neglect the values that we most should cherish. So in the present, we have all kinds of little decisions that we have to make. One of the things that we have to get over is despair. That nothing will work out well is something we do not dare to even for a moment assume. But today we find something interesting and a little dangerous. We find people more interested in the emotional reaction to disaster. We find book after book being published, telling of the terrible things to happen. We also watch television while the actors invade us from outer space and do everything you can think of, including dramatizing prehistoric monsters rising out of the sewers of Los Angeles. <laughs> All of this is part of a tremendous negative anxiety. We find that there's nothing that really amuses us now except tragedy, immorality, and violence. And everything is being done to educate us to this. The problem being that all of these programs are mass production with only one consideration, to get as wide an audience as possible. So by means of various drama and uh, dramatic situations, we are able to contribute trauma to our associates, which apparently is the motive behind most of this. What we are really trying to do is to frighten the individual out of his wits and sell him deodorants at the same time. <laughs> well, we now also have the emerging countries that are looking forward to the time when they can be as badly off as we are. We are also helping them to develop all their industries, arts, sciences, and overthrow their various political allegiances so that in the end they can compete with us so that they will add to our own unemployment and things of this nature. Now, to help these people would have been a wonderful thing, and it is a wonderful thing to help people who are trying to help themselves. But when all we do is communicate to them an ethical code as weak as our own, and even weaker, we are only creating further problems for the future. While we work with these emerging nations, this third group that everyone is talking about, we know they're going to copy what we do, what we think, and what we are. So we should give them something worth copying. We should give them the proof every day that by the development of their integrities they can free their people, give them a new lease on liberties and life, and become members of a solid commonwealth of peoples. Unless we set an example, then they will follow the one we do set, and as soon as possible they will compete with us if possible to overcome our superiority or advancement in political and social and industrial ways. So in uh, our modern time, it is very important 
to start in to find enough about ourselves, about our inner workings, to decide what we are doing to damage situations. The average individual is not informed sufficiently on the problems of world relationships to be dogmatic on these subjects. And he is, his information is largely conditioned uh, by unreasonable factors. He is being fed news that is variously pointed to advance causes of special groups. This makes it very difficult for him to find out the facts of many things that he would like to know. It is, however, possible to, gradually to become better informed on all the problems of administrative life. It is possible to learn more and more about how things should be done correctly. And uh, gradually, by learning something positive, to get away from this eternal ble bleating, this eternal downgrading of everything. Actually, the individual who downgrades is in most cases cooperating with the very thing he wants to attack. And we must begin again as the ancients warned us in the first place, namely that the individual must be right in himself. The only thing that can protect him today is his own integrities, his own virtues, and his own dedications. These may in some ways be expensive. They may prevent him from gaining unfair advantages over other people. But he is here today and gone tomorrow. And when he departs from here, he is going to a place where value is everything. He is going to face an eternity of integrities uh, ill-prepared for the journey. It is much better to realize that it, he must be right here as more important and more permanent and more reasonable than any compromise he can possibly make. Compromises can bring him maybe through this material cycle he is in. But beyond this, when he goes out again into the universe what he, that he came from, compromises against him on every step. He cannot afford it. Now, uh, being a fact that it's an educational sphere in which we now find ourselves, a little of the time that we have been wasting trying to forget where we are and what we are should be devoted to a careful uh, study as far as possible of matters of importance to us. If we find in ourselves blind prejudices on certain fields, then it is our responsibility to ourselves and others that we dig into the subjects against which we have prejudice, study them thoroughly, become proficient in them, and find out what the facts really are. Anyone who merely speaks without knowledge or thought is simply contributing to the common degeneration of human hope and faith. Also in these days, we do note a strong re revival of religious interest. This is very good. Religious interest is something uh, that is perhaps one of the best symptoms that we have at the moment. But it is also true that religions are not actually living what they teach. In most cases, religions are sectarian, and they have become gradually more and more competitive. The result is each religion is composed of persons who believe that they are alone are correct, that they are better, wiser, and more virtuous than any other faith or any other belief. This leads to the weakening of the general texture. We have in the world today a block of about three billion people who claim religious allegiances or convictions. The only way in which they can prove their religion is by working together. If they are one united group, putting the principles of religion above all sectarian denominational differences, they could be the power that changes the course of history. 
they could achieve the thing that is necessary, the proof that the higher truths and ideals of mankind work together, whereas ignorance is competitive. Religion, therefore, could be and should be, and we hope will be, a basis for a union of peoples, and that gradually we will rise above all creedal conflicts. We will rise above all efforts to decide which is the holiest among us and realize that the holiest among us is the one who is servant of all. Under this uh, concept, we are developing more and more religious consciousness. Religion is coming back, and let it come back this time embodied in a true spirit of world brotherhood and not come back again uh, to fight over the various creeds and constantly try to convert people from one faith to another. What we do not need is conversion. What we really do need is dedication to human need. If we get more of that, uh, the religions will flourish as never before. Now, out of all of this problem and everything that has to do with it, we come to another situation that's more or less important. Where do we go from here? Now, the future is a, is a mystery and always has been. No one is quite sure what the future is going to be, but there are some major thoughts on the subject. The future is part of a great pattern in space. It is a constant motion, and Zen tells us something about it, and so does Taoism in China. The future is a dimension of realities. The future is the inevitable consequence of the past working on the present and continuing its procedures. Therefore, a good future must be more or less predicted from the accomplishments of now. If we have an alcoholic who refuses to modify his habits, uh, we can predict a future for him. We will predict that he has, in due time, uh, come to the end of his rope. He will have uh, delirium tremens, and then a reasonable number of years will die, an alcoholic, because he has no intentions of changing his ways. Now, as we look out upon the world around us, if nobody does anything to change things, the future will be the extension of the present. It will be the various harvestings of the crops we have planted. It will depend entirely upon the foundations that we have built, what the future will be. Now, in looking at it on that basis, we realize that we are passing on to posterity the worst dilemma man has ever known. There is nothing that we can really reasonably hope will go well unless we change some of the basic practices which are keeping it in trouble. We will never be able to fight the war that will end in peace. There is just no hope of this. We will never be able to exploit and exhaust our natural resources forever. They are expendable. We can never accomplish by any means processes or uh, policies which are amicable to survival. We cannot hope that the future will suddenly change into a beautiful dimension. We cannot believe that unless we change things now, the future will be any better. So in the future, we see all kinds of achievements. We see people thinking in terms of extending the length of life to 150 years or more. It's quite scientifically possible this can happen. But what will it do if the world is the same as it is now? We will simply have longer time to suffer and pay taxes. <laughs> and this has very little to offer us in the form of joy. Also, what will happen to people in the future whose education and development is for things as they are? 
The rise of, of the computer industry shows us one dimension. Things are changing very rapidly, and that which is a current fact today may be an absurdity tomorrow. It has happened many times in the past. But actually, while we cannot hope to diagnose in detail the future, we have no reason to hope that the advancement and even the perfection of, the, of computerization will have any particular effect upon human morality and ethics. It will only supply another tool for human beings to abuse people in the future whose education and development is for things as they are. The rise of, of the computer industry shows us one dimension. Things are changing very rapidly. And that which is a current fact today may be an absurdity tomorrow. It has happened many times in the past. But actually, while we cannot hope to diagnose in detail the future, we have no reason to hope that the advancement and even the perfection of, the, of computerization will have any particular effect upon human morality and ethics. It will only supply another tool for human beings to abuse. And uh, this is the thing we all have to face, the danger of misusing anything that we call progress. Progress will be exploited as long as humanly possible. And this exploitation will continue as long as an educated, scientifically trained humanity remains colossally ignorant. This type of situation cannot produce any permanent result in the future. If all we ever do is find more ways of commercializing uh, what we call advancement and progress. We are in the midst, therefore, of a situation in which the only possible answer lies in the changing of policy. It changes, the changes must come here if they are to affect things which belong here and will remain here. The individual himself must begin to plan and build a future. He must decide what he wants to do, for example, with the rest of his present years. So for many people, the first step in the problem of the future is to plan the next 10 or 20 years. What is the person going to do in this present situation? He probably would like to believe or hope that in these 20 years that he may have, he will not be under the constant stress and strain of present world crises. He does not want to live these years with a fear of nuclear warfare hanging over his head. He does not want to look forward to a time in which there is no longer any petroleum or that various essential industries go out of existence from bankruptcy. He does not want to look upon a financial situation which goes into some kind of a spiral nosedive and results in the wiping out of the economic security of millions of human beings. These things he does not want to look forward to. And yet, what can he really do to prevent this from happening, if it does? The only thing he can learn to do is very much that what Emerson was uh, told back in New, ha New, ha New England years ago. Someone said to him, Dr. Emerson, if the world ends, what will you do? And Emerson thought for a couple of minutes rather quietly. He said, well, I guess I'll have to get along without it. <laughs> Now, there are ways in which we may have to get along without things that we thought we wanted. We are going to be forced to create a new source of strength. We are going to have to move security from the bank and the building loan to the heart and soul in ourselves. We will have to build our security upon invisibles upon those integrities which are there by divine insight. 
we will have to return the world very largely to the uh, spiritual foundations upon which it was originally built. We are going to have to allow the divine plan to operate and take our refuge in that, to take our refuge in the law rather than in the dangers and insecurities of present living. We may have to face these insecurities any day, but if we have a solid internal foundation, we will be able to survive any external crisis because we know we are in a universe of law and love and order. We, we are not aware of this love and order because we are ourselves blocking it. But there is nothing in the divine plan of things that says that man will destroy himself. But there are many things in the divine plan which say man will sicken himself until he realizes he has to free his consciousness from these destructive factors and elements. One of the things that we will all have to face in the course of time, whether it's now or in the future, is a considerable simplification of living. As the population of the earth increases and natural resources decrease, the individual will find it absolutely essential uh, to change his mode of life. Uh, the profit system as we know it today cannot survive the end of our resources and our basic natural wealth. If we exhaust the major sources of wealth, we cannot continue to use wealth as the basis of our calculations. We are going to have to learn to find out that the great profit that there is is the profit of growth, the profit of hope and uh, the profit of simple, gentle, cooperative ways. I know many people who say they would love to be students. They'd like to think about things. They'd like to release their artistic instincts or uh, do all kinds of creative self-expressions. But they cannot because of the pressures of circumstances around them. Nature is going to remove those external pressures as rapidly as the individual is willing to dedicate himself to the release of his own internal integrities. The individual is responsible. He is responsible because in the very heart and soul of himself he con is convinced that visible things are real. Therefore he wants all he can have of them. Invisible things he's not sure of. And if he must sacrifice something, he will sacrifice that which he does not know to the accumulation of that which he wants. This type of thinking has always more or less dominated human relationships. But it is getting to the point where it cannot endure forever. We are on a very technically critical point in our development of future policies. Everything in the future is going to run to simplification. The age of complication is just reaching its exhaustion. As every factor we know diminishes, and as all things finally reduce themselves to the basic essentials, we will find that the human being is here for one purpose only, and that is to perfect, perfect his inner nature. He is here to grow. He is here to become and not to gain through accumulation. The, the accumulation is very clearly mentioned in most of the scriptures of the world as a false objective, and it is. Accumulation is not going to solve any problem that we have. It, what is going to solve the problem is the individual changing his standards of values. If a person wants to be wise, really sincerely, he has a, a very interesting possibility. In the first place, no matter how wise he becomes, no one else will ever be deprived of the smallest part of wisdom. It's not something that is in short supply. The trouble is it's in short demand. <laughs> Love is something uh, that is also available to all. 
and it is available without limiting anyone else. Because if love is selfish and tries to control other people, it isn't love at all. But all of the great virtues and integrities, wisdom, understanding, skills of all kinds, are non-competitive. They are things which exist and always will exist and will be available to anyone who wants to use them. The great painter, as he becomes a greater and greater artist, does not forbid others to become artists. He has his day, he leaves his treasures, and others come after him. The great truths of life, the beauties of life, the wisdoms of life are all universal. The Greeks had an understanding of this, perhaps better than we do, because they did not consider, for example, an art like architecture to be merely a mechanical, mathematical series of formulas. Uh, they rather considered architecture uh, to be a being, a living thing in somehow. And they gave a muse to it who was the personification of architecture. They gave another muse, Urania, to be the patroness of astronomy. But these deities were mysterious things because if an art is great or a science is great, how can it be communicated? How can it be shared? How can it grow and become subject to moral and ethical laws unless somewhere within that thing itself is a life principle of its own? The ancients believed that all the arts and sciences were the bodies of soul beings, invisible creatures, beings, that had, an, had existence of themselves. They came and favored uh, noted ex exponents. They became the patrons of the great artificers of the past. But all these arts are living things. And every true art and science is not only alive, but it is a moral entity. Every art or science that exists will destroy that which corrupts it. If it is misused, it will turn upon the one who abuses it. If it is used falsely, it will destroy itself and those who practice it falsely. For each art, science, way of life, every problem that a human being needs is controlled by law. And everything helps if it is used, punishes it, punish if it is abused. Therefore, we are not dealing in any th way with things that have no souls or no uh, beings within themselves. The Chinese knew this. They realized in that in some mysterious way, everything that is beautiful and wonderful has a soul. Arithmetic has a soul. History has a soul. But if we continue them to only as being mental agencies of our own creation, we have no way of controlling them. What we do not realize is that these beings exist long beyond our lifespan. Art has been with us from the beginning and will be with us to the end. It has come largely in proper form to those who used it wisely. Those who wanted to exploit art nearly always missed being great artists. The uh, art that is exploited turns upon the one who exploits it. And when a world develops an art based upon selfishness and cupidity, that art begins to tarnish the reputation not only of the artist, but of the whole civilization. Nations have fallen because they have lost the realization of beauty and integrity. So all of these uh, departments, according to the ancients, were alive, really beings. And it's as such, they were of the greatest significance and value to those who served them wisely. Every great exponent of knowledge is a dedicated person. 
and according to the measure of the dedication, such will be the measure of the accomplishment. So we have to recognize that in building the future, that there are two futures to be considered. Our personal future, which has been in our own hands since the beginning and always will be, and the collective future, which is fashioned gradually out of groups of persons who have achieved individual integrity. The golden age we look for is an age in which individuals themselves have been converted to the principles of integrity and honor. Until that time, the struggle must go on. Uh, we have seen what happens in, in all different walks of life with the exploitation and abuse and misuse of resources. We know also that misuse has a wide aura around it. Misuse results in the spread of defeatism. It causes the rest of the world to wonder if anything is any good. It causes us to doubt those closest to us, simply because under the present system, ulterior motives may show, may show anywhere. Now, nature has ways of helping this situation along. Nature says that where integrity fails in a nation, the collapse of that nation is inevitable. If integrity fails in the individual, his own problems become unbearable. There is no question in the world that a person who abuses, misuses, or neglects the proper use of his own faculties is going to suffer physically as a result. A large part of sickness today is the result of nature reminding us that we're not doing it right. Sickness in many ways is inevitable among those who go around criticizing and condemning, running up acidity at a great rate, who are locking their minds to true progress and in this way destroying the proper eliminational processes of the body. In every case, the person who does not live right will suffer from the consequences of living badly. This constitutes an incredible rise in every type of psychological ailment. We are a race today of nervous wrecks, not because anything is really that bad, but because our reactions to the problems that need solution are so poor and so helpless and hopeless that they continue to contribute to our discomfort. Years ago, there was quite a furor of thinking on a constructive level. The idea that the mind should think hopefully on most every situation that arises. That the mind should reaffirm to itself constantly that deity is in its heavens and all is basically right with the world. And the part we don't like about it is part of the rightness we've got to learn to understand. But gradually this idea of trying to see good in things has been turned into a kind of a Pollyanna attitude in which we don't think things through, we just simply gush a little optimism. Actually, however, if we have to do something, I think we should try more and more to cultivate the tendency to seek for and find something constructive in the things that happen to us. Sometimes that's going to be difficult. Sometimes it may be impossible at the present stage of our integration. But in many small matters, at least, it is perfectly possible to view difficulties as opportunities. Uh, the what day when we didn't want the visitor and the show visitor showed up is an opportunity not to be disconcerted or irritable, but to hunt for some new value that we are going to share with that other person or they're going to share with us. Everything that happens can have some kind of meaning if we are looking for that. If, on the other hand, we are aware only of what is wrong and neglect all else, uh, we are much in the condition that was described by Socrates in his uh, allegory or parable of the glass of water. 
uh, Socrates had a glass half filled with water. And he explained to his disciples that an optimist looking at the half glass of water would say that it is half full. The pessimist would say it is half empty. But it is the same. Now, the pessimist in life is the individual who sees the empty side. The optimist is the one who sees the fullness of some part of it. And each of us could begin to develop a little optimism about things we can control. We can become a little wiser managers of our own affairs and lives. We can become a little more self-reliant. We can control our appetite so that we do not unnecessarily support uh, values which are not good. All around, this is going to have to happen. Now, uh, actually, if we begin to be discriminating, this will result in a considerable conservation of natural resources. If the individual is thrifty, is economical, practical, and careful, does not fall for all the glowing advertisements with which he is surrounded. If he lives within a reasonable pattern of responsibilities and financial integrities, he will save considerable money, and he will also have more time to do constructive thinking. We are in so now tied to the idea of enjoyment that we really believe that this world was created just for fun. And that's the strange part of it is that everybody says it's funny, but very few people are having any fun. <laughs> Every What we call fun is desperate uh, extravagance of one kind or another to make up from a, for a constant boredom within ourselves. So if we go into the future now, what kind of a future are we going to visualize? Because we have to visualize something or it will not happen. Now each person can have his own future because each individual has hopes that are his own. But various systems of thought and so forth have had prophetic attitudes on this problem of the future. In the prophecies of Nostradamus, he brings into focus the paraclete or the prince of peace and he says that this being or this principle it doesn't necessarily have to be a person any more than arithmetic has to be a person but it is alive but the paraclete or the principle of world peace should arise among the nations of human society shortly after the end of the present century that in the beginning of the 21st century there will be a major uh, variation in our policies that for, uh, we will by that time reach a condition in which we will realize that true joy, true happiness, uh, true insights and understandings are being completely blocked by what we call success and as a result of that success is destroying society. But, uh, but uh, Nostradamus was convinced that there was going to be a great re reformation of human society. That the way of the future was inevitable. Not only from the standpoint of prophecy, but from the standpoint of analysis of the physical facts of living. That gradually and inevitably humanity is going to accept the destiny for which it was originally intended. And that destiny was to understand and unfold internal potential. That this is going to become the great fad of the future. That it's going to gradually take away from us all the miseries and misfortunes of our modern educational system. It is going to put education where it belongs a dedication to discovering those things which will contribute most and most immediately to the improvement of humanity. That education is not going to be merely theoretical. That the education will include a means of culturing the inner life so that the soul for the first time can show its face in this world. These changes must come 
and everyone in their own heart and soul would dream of a future in which the evils we know would no longer exist. Well, if the evils no longer exist, there's only one reason for that. We will have cured them. We are hoping maybe the sky will open and some mysterious divine power will wipe out calamities and bestow upon us joys which we have not earned. This seems rather remote. The power that will bring us the golden age, the divine principle which we hope will come to us, must come through us. We must make our own dedications and our own associations with life and make them so that they will endure and carry on. Actually, we have another interesting problem in our dimensions of time. And the, this particular phase of it is pretty well uh, discussed and thought through uh, by the Greek mathematicians. We, that is today, now. Tomorrow will be the past. What was today the future will tomorrow be the present. All of these time patterns, under the guidance of thy wise old Cronus with his scythe and hourglass, the whole problem is relative. We are in a, the moment only at this moment, as Zen points out. There is a now. And strangely enough, this now is a forever in itself. All past and future are flowing around the concept of the only reality, which is now. Uh, the past is gone, dead, a dream. The future is unlived and to a large measure unknowable and is merely the abstract substance of things hoped for. Past and future are strange, intangible divisions of eternal time. Now is the moment that is of the greatest significance and is the great reality. For things that happen must happen now, regardless of when that now is. They must happen in the very presence of a reality. Therefore, things that happen that are solutional, are real. Those things which are hopes or fears are not real. The reality is now and the conduct of our own lives now. Everything that is important to us must impel us to immediate action. It must give us the courage to make the changes in ourselves in the only dimension that is real, now. Actually, now will be, will be the moment when we make them. It's a question as to whether the now or the making of them comes first. But at the moment we do it, we come to now. Until we do it, we are in fantasy. We are in fantasy as long as we say, tomorrow I will be better. Well, we also will be in fantasy when we say, yesterday I was worse. The only realities are those which are associated with the immediate accomplishment of necessary changes. And for the individual, the accomplishment of necessary changes begins when he decides to make them. The moment he makes these decisions and puts them into action, he changes both the past and the future. Of the past, he escapes from its terrors. Of the future, he builds foundations under its hopes. The person was, is, and will be, according to the motion of his own consciousness, through the past, the present, and toward the future. Therefore, we all want a better future. To many religious people, the better future is a world beyond the grave, in which things are beautiful, in which all the sorrows and miseries of this life are left behind. But there is more to it than that. The individual moving into any dimension of life, here or hereafter, must take with him what he is. And until what he is is compatible with his hopes. 
he will not find the peace, happiness, and understanding that he desires. I think then that perhaps no time before have we had the skills to estimate the future as well as we could now. We now have the facilities of measuring the commodities of life. We know how much oil there is still in the ground. We know what life forms are becoming extinct. We know everything that is necessary to the gradual acceptance of the challenge of that which is right. We don't have to wait until the last tree is gone before we decide it's time to save the timber. It is no longer necessary for us to reach a point where the only locomotion possible is a bicycle because the, go the oil is all gone. We, we should not have to face these emergencies in this way. If we begin by conserving, we begin also by turning creativity into new channels of solution. As long as we can get away, away with what we're doing, things will not change. But the moment we begin to see the values must change, minds will begin to find ways of changing constructively. We can live indefinitely on this planet if we gain the full insight of how to do it. We are not going to be bound to the things we now have forever. We are not going to be sub subject to the calamities of international relations forever. We are gradually going to solve these things. But we must begin to solve them now. The individual and the nation must begin to take stock of available futures, of available things that must be worked with, and then settle down at last to the way of working with them, which will produce the results that we need. There is no reason why humanity should ever starve. There are many, many forms of food and many ways of maintaining the body that we know nothing of today. There is no reason why we should not be able to fulfill our life expectancies, even if we do not have all the commodities. Because within man are the powers to adapt to anything that is necessary to his survival. The more he depends upon the external, the more frightened he will be. But the more he realizes the potential to solve, which is within himself, and that he can solve anything that he needs to solve, that he can accomplish whatever is necessary to his own survival. For life is going to be preserved from within himself, and by the release of his own soul power, by the release of his own understanding and his natural affections and regards, little by little, as every commodity fails, something will take its place. But that something will be better, because it will have to be from a different level than that of an exhausted planet. It has to be the power of consciousness of life and of soul, not only for the individual to save himself, but to save his world along with him. Everything that is necessary to us is available. But it is only accessible to us if we no longer block every part of our lives with this very foolish t sense of competition. As long as business as usual controls the world, business as usual will end in bankruptcy. But the, when we use these various facilities not to make profit from them, but to apply them to our needs as nature intended, we will find that out of a powerful, cooperative commune of effort, we will not only continue the planet, but we will find new healing powers, we will find new length of life, new opportunities for true joy, more pleasure for ourselves, more security for our children. All these things are possible because none of them are primarily part of the physical plan of things. They are all part of the inner life which has to come out. When the inner life comes out, the material body and its condi conditions will be properly solved. But all solution to the problems of our time must begin within ourselves. 
and they will begin when the outside is no longer adequate. We will not face these values until we have to. But when we have to face them, we will. And when we do face them, we will find that our fears were all imaginary. It is, it is really important to know that within each of these little atoms that we call elements now, it each is a spark that is strong enough to tear the world apart. It is also strong enough to put together all the weaknesses of existence. There is more energy in an atom than we would require to maintain this world for a million years. So we've got to learn how. But we've also got to realize that in learning how, we must do it with love and affection and understanding, and our motivation must be to save and to serve, and not to accumulate and to foreclose on each other. If we use the powers that we have and gradually release what is available, we have nothing to worry about the future. We have already found to our final contentment that there is no use worrying about the past. Nothing is needed to perfect the future. What is necessary is a good hard job right now, getting hold of things and doing that which ensures us our proper place in the universal plan of things. If we achieve this, we have nothing really to worry about, because after all, we are here for a little while, but we're in eternity forever. We come back and, f and fill worlds, we become people, we return again into the divine spheres from which we came. We are here to live and to grow and to love and to serve. And if we follow those rules, the past will become beautiful, the present will become meaningful, and the future will become inevitable goodness for all concerned. We just have to get to work and do the best we can with it. Thanks a lot.